The really important topic of this video is what's called uh, commutators. And this is really powerful, and it's actually the last of the sort of theory. And then the next bunch of videos are going to deal specifically with how to apply these theories to the Rubik's Cube. Uh, the If you're looking, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, you can download the app that I made and that been using to demonstrate these different puzzles. It's it's called Permutant, and it's available on the uh, App Store. It's either going to be free or practically free, so I recommend you get that if it helps you uh, play with these puzzles, and it's fun. Okay, what a commutator is, is a sequence of four moves. Suppose I have two permutations. Uh, alpha is 1, 3, and beta is uh, 2, 3, 5. Now, if I were to do alpha followed by, if I did a composition of these four things, alpha, beta, beta inverse, alpha inverse, well, that would just get us back. That wouldn't do anything because these two things would kind of undo each other, and then the alpha and the alpha inverse would undo each other. But if instead I do alpha, beta, and then I do alpha inverse, beta inverse, that's usually not going to get us back to the, um, to the identity. And I'll go ahead and actually calculate it out, uh, calculate it out for you. So alpha is 1, 3, beta is 2, 3, 5. Alpha inverse is still 1, 3. I'll, I'll go up here. Alpha inverse is 1, 3. And beta inverse is actually 2, 5, 3. Previous videos show how to do that. And when I go ahead and calculate this, I start with 1. 1 goes to 3. 3 goes in here, goes to 5. 5 stays at 5. 5 goes to 3. Now 3 goes in, turns into 1, 1 goes into here, stays a 1, 1 goes into here, becomes a 3, 3 goes into here, becomes a 2. And when I put 2 in, it stays a 2, this 2 becomes a 3, this 3 becomes a 1, this 1 stays a 1, so it closes out the cycle. So even though A and B are, this one's 2 cycle, 3 cycle, the process of doing this commutator, this thing of the form alpha, beta, and then we have the inverse of the first thing, the inverse of the second, it often creates, uh, that sequence of four moves often creates a new move, uh, a new permutation, which is fairly simple because even though it doesn't fully, the, the, these inverses don't fully get to undo what happened originally, they undo a lot of them. And a lot of puzzles um, depend on moves, sequences of moves that have this form. And I'm going to take you through a bunch of puzzles uh, that we have on the app and see how commutators uh, could be used uh, to, to, to solve them. I want to show you how the idea of these commutators could be used to create moves in uh, puzzles. For instance, uh, puzzle number seven, you might remember this is the one where you can do these, these L-shaped moves. And there's only nine legal moves, but by combining them, uh, use, but by doing a four-move sequence that is a commutator, there's a good chance that it is uh, going to be useful for us. So I'm going to solve it, have it in solve state. So let's just see what some commutators, if I just wanted to make up a random commutator. Well, if I take something like this one and I go, oh, oh and by the way, every move, like move number one, even though it, it moves those three things clockwise, now there's not officially an inverse that moves them counterclockwise, but I can kind of make an inverse by move, doing that move twice. So I'll just call this, this move one, and doing it twice, we'll call that one inverse. Now, if I make a commutator, like um, 1, 3, 1 inverse, 
3 inverse. Well, that doesn't accomplish anything at all uh, because 1 and 3, those moves don't have any numbers in common. But maybe if I do 1, 2, 1 inverse, 2 inverse, it might accomplish something useful. In this case, you can see it cycles. Uh, 1 goes to position 2, 2 goes to position 6, 6 goes to position uh, 1. So this is an example. So doing that 4-move commutator causes an L-shape, but an L-shape where it's 3 like this instead of the, this like upside-down L. But maybe there's an even more useful commutator. I'll go, um, if I go 1 and then 2 inverse, and then 1 inverse, and 2. Well, this one looks really useful. It caused 1 to go to position 2, 2 to go to, two to, go to position 3, and 3 to go to position 1. And you can see how that might come in handy to have that. Now, it might not feel that satisfying to just try a random commutator and see you know, if it does anything useful. But knowing that there's such thing as commutators and knowing that it's worth trying them, that's you conquering a puzzle because most people don't know that a commutator has a chance to do it. So it's not, then there are going to be some more satisfying things coming up with commutators where, where we sort of deliberately make one that accomplishes something that we, like a goal that we have. This one's kind of uh, testing out a random commutator because commutators often will only move around a small number of pieces. Uh, another two that might come in handy, if I do one and five, they have something in common, and then one inverse, five inverse, I see that does a two, five, uh, two goes to position five, five goes to position nine, nine goes to position two, so we kind of have that. If we ever need to swap to a three cycle on these three, we could have that handy. And one other one maybe is a one, five inverse, one inverse, five. And we see that one does a two goes to position five, uh, five ends up in position six, six ends up in position two. So that does sort of a backwards L. So these commutators are coming in handy for solving uh, puzzle number uh, seven. There are other commutators I could do, like 2, 1, 2 inverse, 1 inverse, you know, things like that. But this just gives you an idea of how if you have a new puzzle, you could develop, by doing commutators, some moves that have a really good chance at being like things that you can add to your list of, of, of moves. The situation in Puzzle 7 that combines strategies from the last lecture, the um, conjugates, with the uh, strategies from this lesson, the commutators. So we saw that if I want to do a, uh, if I want to cycle around three things on this type of puzzle, this is with the L shape, I can go one, two, inverse, one inverse, two, And that will that will cycle those three around. Um, and if I do it again, one, two inverse, one inverse, two. It's getting there. And one last time, one, two inverse, one inverse, two. So doing that four move or or six move if you if you're counting the inverses two moves, uh, will put the thing in position one into position two, the thing into position two into position three, and the thing in position three into position one. And I can do that here with the five, six, seven, or the nine, 10, 11, but I can't do it with the 14, 15, 13, even though I want to. I want to put the thing in this position, which is position 13, into position 14, and the thing in position 14 to the position 15, but I actually can't, those aren't legal moves. So there's only nine legal moves, one, two, three, five, six, seven, nine, ten, eleven. So the trick is to use a setup move. If I can get the 14, 15, and 13 into 
these three places, then I can do the move. So I'm actually going to do that. It's easy to get the 14, 15, and 13. I just do um, move number 9. That gets the 14 up. Move number 10. That gets the 15 up. And move number 11 gets the 13 up. Now I can do the sort of 1, 2 inverse, 1 inverse, 2 thing. And that gets the 13, 14, 15 fixed up. And now I have to go get them back. Now remember, I did uh, 9, 10, 11 to get them into place. So I have to do those moves the uh, to undo the setup move. This is sort of like the A inverse move. I have to do 11 inverse, 10 inverse, 9 inverse. And then that puzzle is solved. So that's a combination of using uh, conjugation was the setup. Then I did the move itself to cycle the three things was the commutator. And then I finish up the conjugation by doing the setup move uh, in reverse, the inverse of the setup move. Another puzzle where the commutator concept is going to be useful is um, puzzle number 13. So here we've got this game, you might remember it, where you can rotate. I'm going to call this move A, this move B, this move C. And if I click the counterclockwise button, this is A inverse, B inverse, C inverse. I don't really need the inverses because I could do A inverse by just going twice on A. Uh, I'm going to make this into solved position because remember, our our goal in in this challenge is to somehow get uh, the thing in position to, to do a four, five, six, uh, three cycle. The thing in position four wants to go to position five. The thing in position five wants to go to position six. The thing in position six wants to go to position four. But I'm gonna I'm gonna put this into solve mode and just let's just see kind of what happens if I try some some commutators. Like one of them is what if I do uh, B C. B inverse, C inverse. Well, we look at that, and a lot of things are still in their original place, the 1, the 3, and the 4. It turns out that that 4 sequence move does a, uh, the thing in position 2 ends up in position 5, the thing in position 5 ends up in position 6, the thing in position 6 ends up in position 2. So that 4 move sequence causes these three guys to cycle, and maybe that will come in handy. But maybe there's even things even more useful. So I'll try, what if I do instead um, B, C inverse, B inverse, C, and I look at that one, and that ends up doing uh, a 2, 5, 3, 3 cycle. Um, try, try two more things, and let's just see what happens. Um, if I do... Uh, B inverse, C, B, C inverse. Now that's interesting because the 1, 2, and 3 are still in their original place. This one does a, uh, the thing in position 4 went to position 5, the thing in position 5 went to position 6, and the thing in position 6 went to position 1. So that's really going to come in handy because that's going to solve our puzzle. And just for um, for completeness, why don't I also see what happens if I were to do uh, B inverse, C inverse, B, C. And we can see that does a, a, a 3, 4, 5, uh, 3 cycle. So if I'm, if I have my original challenge here, which is to try to get a 4, 5, 6, we now know, and this was just through sort of messing around, that if I do B inverse, sorry, C, B, C inverse, it will solve that puzzle. Again, this may not feel like I'm really solving the puzzle. I just made up something that might work and saw what it did, but that is something that you can do in puzzles. Uh, we are going to see, though, coming up, that there will be opportunity to actually 
uh, more deliberately make a, s a sequence of moves that happens to be a commutator um, that will sort of accomplish some sort of goal instead of just randomly making one. But randomly making one, a lot of good patterns have been discovered that way. In puzzle number 11, we have this situation. We have all the numbers in their proper places except for three of them. I want the thing in position 4 to go to position 16, the thing in position 16 to go to position 13, and the thing in position 13 to go to position 4. So I so, so I want to do a 4-16-13 three cycle. Now the moves avail to, available to me are kind of interesting. There's two moves and they're inverses. And just to kind of, let's look at these moves for a second. I'll look at move B first because it's sort of the simpler one. B kind of moves that bottom row around. Everything kind of moves uh, to the left. You can kind of see the way that's happening. See that if you watch one of the numbers like the four, it just moves uh, to the left. And B inverse moves everything to the right. That's a pretty simple move. Now the A move is quite complicated. It does so many different things. Watch what happens. The A, it puts the, well, most importantly, it puts the 16. It moves uh, the thing in position 4 to the position 16. But it also does so much other stuff, like a big mess. And if I undo it, well, I'm not, my puzzle's not solved, but I'm back to the original. So I'll just kind of look at that. Definitely the first two pieces of it here are 416, and then a whole bunch of other junk. But notice how the rest of the bottom row does not change with move A. So position 4 goes to position 16, and a whole bunch of other stuff happens. Well, that's good because we want to get position, thing in position 4 to position 16 to solve this puzzle. Now if I undo it, well, I'm back to where I started. So here comes a major, major insight. And this is, believe it or not, half of the Rubik's Cube can be understood with this, this puzzle. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to do move uh, A because, yes, that puts the 16 into its proper place. But it messes up everything else on top, at least. If I undo it, I'm back to the beginning, so that didn't do much. So b before, so when I undo it, the thing in position 16 goes back to position 4. But I don't want the thing in position 16 to go back to position 4. I want the number 4 to go back to position 4. So before I undo move A, I'm going to do move B to get the 4 into where the 16 is or was. And now... When I undo move A, a bunch of things will happen. The 4 will go back to where the 16 came from, which is great because that's where it wants to be. And this other stuff that got all messed up, it's going to all get fixed by the inverse. And now I'm one move away from being all done because uh, I did that B move, and that kind of moved uh, this 15 and 16 and 14 over. So by doing B inverse... The whole puzzle is solved. Notice how those four things, if I go back to restart, were a commutator. It was it was A, B, A inverse, B inverse. And it caused the three cycle. And this is so important because of the four algorithms we're going to learn to develop for the Rubik's Cube, two of them can be understood in this way. I'm going to look at it one more time just because it's so, so important. A did get the thing in 4, position 16, and did a whole bunch of damage up here. If I do A inverse, well, that's not so good. It just puts 16 back to where it came from. So I'll do A again. Before I do e A inverse, I'll do this B move. Puts the 4 here. So now when I do A inverse, it's not the 16 that goes back to where he started, but it's the 4 that goes back to where the 16 started. All this other stuff is going to get fixed because I did the inverse. And then finally, B inverse. You can just see that we're one move away from being done. I'm going to spend some time comparing uh, puzzle 7 
which is this one where we can do the, the L-shaped moves, and puzzle 13, which is the one where we can, um, we have these triangle wheels that can move around. And these are two puzzles uh, that we looked at and we I showed you how we can kind of randomly try a commutator and just see what it does. Um, I want to show you how by comparing it to puzzle number 11, we can actually come up with those same commutator moves, but this time do it in a more uh, deliberate way where I'm not just randomly making one and seeing what it does, which is still something that's worthwhile sometimes in, in doing these puzzles, but it's even better if we have like a plan, like a goal, and we find a way to use commutators to achieve that goal. Uh, look at how this is happening again in puzzle 11. So I'll, we, 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 we do a three cycle, and I just want to look at this just again because it's, it's so important. Uh, this A move puts the 16 into its proper place, but it messes up so many other things. Um, namely the 13 went from where it was over here and ended up kind of in no man's land. If I undo move A, 13 comes back where it was and the 16 goes back to where he started. So I put the 16 back there again, but this time before I undo it, I'm going to put the 4 where the 16 is. That way, when I undo move A, instead of the 16 going back to his original spot, which is where the 4 wanted to be, now the 4 is going to go back to his original spot. Go back to the spot where the 16 originally was, which is where the 4 does want to end up eventually. The 13 is going to go from where it got sent to back to the spot where the 4 is. Oops, I meant that. Okay. Now, the only reason that the 4 was over here is because he had been moved by the B move. So now by undoing the B move, comes back, and now the 3 cycle has been accomplished. And this is a pretty hard thing to get your mind around. Sometimes what I like to do to just keep getting a feel for it as I follow around, I say, okay, let me just watch what happens with 16 as I do these four moves. The 16 gets moved to its proper spot. The 16 gets moved away to over here. 16 is still in that spot because the A inverse move doesn't affect that. And the B inverse puts the 16 back to the spot that it had moved to. Then I go again and say, okay, I understand. I agree the 16 is going to end up here. Now let's just watch the status of the number 13. 13 wants to go We're here where the 4 is. So by doing move A, 13 goes to no man's land, but he wants to be here where the 4 is. But if I undo it, he's going to go where the 16 is. So what I do is I put the 4 where the 16 is, then I undo move A, the 13 ends up over there, but then I undo move B, and the 13 goes where he wants to be. And finally, let's do it again, but this time we'll watch the progress of the number 4. The 4 wants to end up over here where the 16 is. So the 16 ends up over here. I don't want to send the 16 back to its original spot, because that's where 4 belongs. I want to send the 4 back to the spot where the 16 came from. So by putting the 4 where the 16 is now, and then undoing it, the 4 goes back where it came from and the B inverse doesn't affect the 4. Anyway, it is pretty tricky, but it's definitely worth spending some time, even if it's a few hours or a few days, getting your mind around that. Now let's compare this to puzzle number 7. Puzzle number 7 is the one where you can do these L-shaped moves. And I'm going to set this one up so that it's like almost done. So it's like this one, two, three, everything else is in place. Okay. And I want to show you how we could reason it out to swap, to put the two into the, the thing that's, the two into its proper position, 
the three into its prior position. So the thing in position one wants to go to position two. The thing in position two wants to go to position three. The thing in position three wants to go to um, position one. And one thing I can do is by doing move number one, I can get the two into his proper place. So the two's in his proper place. The three went out here to no man's land. If I undo that move by doing it twice, the two comes back to its original place and the three goes from no man's land back to position two. Well, I don't want the two back in its original place. I want the one in the place where the two came from. So before I undo this move number one by doing it twice, I'm going to get the one where the two currently is. And then when I undo that move, the one ends up where the two was. And now, uh, now the two and three are just one move away from being done. So th from that, you can kind of see how the one ended up where it wanted to be. But the, but the other two numbers are still hard to follow. So it's hard to look at it all at once. So I'm going to redo that. But now this time, we keep our eye on one of the other numbers. That last time we were keeping our eye on the number one and seeing how it ended up where the two started. Okay, so here I go. Uh, this time let's, let's keep our eye on the, on the number three. Uh, actually, we'll keep our eye on the number two. So the two ended up in its, in its right spot. Then I put the one where the two was. Well, the two's out here now. But when I undo that first move, send the one where the two came from originally, the two was over here a moment ago, but I moved him out of the way to put the one into his second spot that he was in. So now I have to undo that, and the two's there. And we'll look at this again, this time from the point of view of the, um, of the number three. So I'm just going to pop these numbers back in. Now the three wants to be where the one currently is. Well, I put the two in here. I moved the two to a straight spot. And the three wants to go where the one is. So by moving the one into position two, and now when I, when I move the one where he wants to go, where the two originally was, the three ends up in the spot where the one went to. So now the three is where the one went to. So if I undo that other move, the three is going to go back to where one came from, which is exactly where the one, where the three wanted to be. So that that's kind of showing. It's, it's actually very similar uh, in the way it works to um, to puzzle number eleven in that it caused a three cycle. But it, it's hard to to see that one. Uh, last one I want to show you is how we could have reasoned out puzzle number 13 using this idea, the idea from, from puzzle number 11. So here the 5 wants to go where the 6 is, and the 6 wants to go where the 4 is. So my first move, B, inverse, does put the 5 where he wants to be. The 4 is still in position 6, where he doesn't want to be. The 6 got sent all the way over here into no man's land. And if I undo that move, well, the 6 ends up in the place where in position 5, and the 5 goes back to position 4. Well, I don't want the 5 in position 4. I want the 4 in position 4. So, before I undo that move, because I, I like the 5 in this place, but I want the 4 where 5 was. So by um, doing move C, I put the 4 where the 5 now is. And then if I undo the first move I did, which is actually the move B, instead of sending the 5 back to his original spot in the corner here, it's going to get send the 4 to the five's original spot, which is exactly where he wants to be. But in doing so, I also moved six 
to the place where the five just was. Now remember, the five actually started out over here where the six wants to be. So this is really good. That second move accomplished a lot. It moved the four to his place and it moved the six to where the five got to so that when I undo uh, that other move, which you see in verse, I get four, five, six. So these three cycles, um, it's, a, it's a very important thing. It's going to be used a lot in the Rubik's Cube. I just wanted to show you to compare um, puzzles 11. 11 is really an important one to study. And then to see how puzzle 7 with the L shapes and puzzle 13 sort of um, use the same ideas. And it's also good because now you see how these commutators can be intentionally made instead of just like hoping that it does something useful or just doing a random commutator and writing down what it accomplished, even though that is still a thing that's, that's worthwhile sometimes. A really important puzzle for understanding the Rubik's Cube is puzzle number 12. Now look at this puzzle number 12. We're, our goal, we want to swap the 1 and the 5 and the 8 and the 4. And one of the movements I have doesn't do that. It swaps 1 and 4 and uh, and 5 and 8, so that's not, it kind of, it puts these two guys in these this place and vice versa. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to swap the 1 with the 5 and the 4 with the 8, but that is a move we have, and we could undo it. Uh, this other move is pretty crazy. Take a look what happens when I click on here. When I click on this move, a lot happens. Let me undo it and show you again. A lot happens. But one thing that definitely does happen is that the 4 and 8 get swapped. 4 and 8 get swapped, and down here, these 8 guys, a bunch of stuff happens to them. It's all messed up down there. So, But at least the 4 and 8 got swapped around. This bottom, a lot of stuff happened there. Pretty confusing. If I undo uh, B, well, I'm back to where I started. But what if I do move, uh, move B, and before I undo it, I do move A. See, if I do move, uh, when, I, when I undo B, the 4 and 8 gets swapped back. And everything else gets fixed. So if I do B, and before I do B inverse, I do A. Now look what's going to happen. When I do B inverse, this stuff's all going to get fixed, but now instead of the 4 and 8 going back to their position, it's the 1 and 5 that are going to get swapped. And now my puzzle's done because now when I do A inverse and swap the 4 and 1 and the 5 and 8, it's all done. So what I've accomplished is these two two swaps. And this has the, uh, let me restart it, this has the form of a commutator because the moves I did were B, A, B inverse, A inverse. This idea is going to be used in the Rubik's Cube along with the last puzzle. Those two puzzles are, I think, the two most important puzzles for understanding uh, how these commutators end up in puzzles, but not by random chance, but through a, a deliberate plan.